Bang, bang. That's the gavel right there until we've got a better one. We're going to get this thing started. We've got several bills on our calendar, but. Here she comes. That was fast. All right. Now we got a gavel. I'd like to call the Finance and Ways and Means Committee subcommittee to order for April 7th, 2021. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Representatives Baum, Here. Camper, Freeman, Here. Gant, Here. Hawk, Here. Hazelwood, Here. Lynn, Here. Ogles, Todd, Here. Whitson, Here. Williams, Here. Wendell, Here. Chairman Hicks. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Members, are there any announcements or any personal orders before we begin? Chair Lady Hazelwood, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, like the opportunity to introduce Mark Litchford. He's sitting in the audience with Representative Helton, and um, his father and I are going to be getting married on May 15th because we're going to get out of here on time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else have any personal orders? Representative Freeman, you're recognized. Um, item 55 on our short calendar today is, uh, is a bill of mine, and it's named after uh, Representative Jim Coley, who is here today. Uh, and I don't know if we're going to get to it or not, but I just want to make sure to mention that and um, thank him for all the work he's done on this over the past couple of years. Thank you very much. Members, any other personal orders? <coughs> Seeing none. All right, members, we're going to, we do have several items on our calendar. We have a total of 60 bills. We have a regular calendar, an addendum calendar, and a sports facilities calendar. So. You may have to bear with us just a little bit as we uh, get organized to get through these. Members, we're going to start with, on the regular calendar, item number 38. Item number 38, without objection, House Bill 1582 moves to the Hill on the Sports Facilities Calendar. Without objection, seeing none, roll to the Sports Facilities Calendar. All right, with that said, that brings us to the Sports Facilities Calendar. We're going to take that up first. So if you would go to your Sports Facility Sports facilities calendar, that's going to be item number one, House Bill 1204 by Chairman Zachary. Sir, you are recognized for a brief description. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have an amendment, which is drafting code 4642. Yes, sir. That's 4642, correct. is that correct? 4642, yes, sir. All right, do we have a motion to second on the amendment? We have a motion to second. Any discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, we're now voting on drafting code 004642 on to House Bill 1204. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. And we're back on the bill as amended. And it looks like we have a, another amendment number two. And I do not see the sponsor of... All right, members, we do have a second amendment on that by Leader Camper, and unfortunately she's not here, which is going to cause us to hit a speed bump for just a second. So um, we are going to have to roll this to the heel of the sports calendar, so we'll pick you right back up in a second, and I know that's not something that I'm wanting to do, but that's kind of the posture we're going to have to be in. So without objection, House Bill 1204 will be rolled to the heel of the sports calendar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, that brings us to item number two. Item number two on our sports facilities calendars, House Bill 157 by Representative Beck. We have a motion and a second. And 
And I do not see the sponsor. So without objection, we'll roll, roll House Bill 157 to the heel of the sports facilities calendar. Item number three. Item number three is House Bill 975 by Chairman Williams, and I think he's trying to go find Leader Camper. So without objection, we're gonna roll House Bill 975 to the hill of the sports facilities calendar. Representative uh, Zachary, you may be back in just a second, so hold on just one second. Without objection, 975 is rolled to the hill. Okay, item number four on our sports facilities calendar is House Bill 1437 by Chairman Hicks. Do we have a motion? No. Motion and a second. Chairman Hicks, you're recognized. All right, thank you very much. Okay, and we've already adopted the amendment, so we are prepared to discuss House Bill 1437. Puts into place a financial agreement that the state has developed with the Tennessee Titans to put Nissan State in the same posture as every other sports team in Tennessee. Uh, the legislation also puts into place a public-private partnership that creates an investment that will reap greater returns for the state in the long run. Um, but for safety measures and because of the stadium's infrastructure and accommodations are 20-plus years old, the Titans are at a pivotal turning point as it relates to renovations at Nissan Stadium. Nissan Stadium, this bill is an opportunity for the state, the city, and the Titans to partner on revising the current financial structure of the sales tax revenue to the state, which would allow the organization to make a significant investment in not only the renovations, but the campus development. And I stand to answer any questions that you may have. Members, you've heard the explanation. Any discussion? Representative Lynn? Hi there. I just was wondering, um, what are their plans for the campus development? What are they planning on developing? Thank you. Uh, Chairman. Chairman Hicks. Thank you, uh, Chair Lady. That's a, that's a good question. I think a lot of that design is still being made. Um, I saw some of the, I guess, some pictures of what's being laid out there, but as far as a definite, this is what they're going to do with it, uh, that has not been made that I'm aware of. Representative Lynn. Thank you. I was just curious. Normally when we have um, sales tax uh, thing bills like this, we usually have a general idea of what they might do with the money. So I was just wanting to know. Thank you. Any additional discussion? Leader Gant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope this is a model that we can use in other parts of the state as well, and I just want to make that part of the record that uh, other parts of the state are going to be looking at this model to uh, to move forward and use it as, a, as an example. Uh, you know, uh, obviously I'm from West Tennessee, and I want to see these type things uh, benefit Memphis, Memphis Grizzlies, and you know, that uh, uh, arena as well. So it's a good piece of legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing it and uh, look forward to uh, supporting it. Chairman thank Hicks. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Chairman Hawk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll echo uh, Leader Gantz's uh, statements as well. I think, and I'll be, I'll call out in particular, Amy Adams Strunk has been amazing in her uh, work within the community here and across the state of Tennessee. Uh, you, you think about what have the Titans done for Greene County, the, the Titans caravan that came, came to Greene County, and uh, they brought T-Rack, and, and then when Jake Locker was the quarterback back in the day, he came by and, and entertained 600 kids in Mossheim Elementary School. So the Titans have a far and broad reach uh, across the state of Tennessee. I think there's going to be a tremendous personal investment from Ms. Strunk herself, as well as what the, the campus may look like. I feel confident that retail, restaurants, uh, there's going to be a, a a whole, uh, a whole community and investment made that's going to be substantial for, uh, uh, for, for visitors to this region and strong uh, support to the rest of the state as well. So thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, I appreciate Chairman Hicks. Thank Chairman you. Hicks. Thank you very much, Chairman Hall. Any further discussion? If not, since the bill does have a cost, we will have to place it behind the budget and consider it at a later date without objection. 1437 will go behind the budget. Thank you, Committee Chairman. All right, committee, that brings us back to item number one on the sports facilities calendar. We do have a motion and a second. Give me just a second to catch up with my spot here.
All right, members, that brings us back to item number one. It's gonna be House Bill 1204 by Chairman Zachary. You have a motion to second. Please continue with a brief description, but let's get in the right posture. We did, we are back to amendment number two is where we picked up. Amendment number two is by Leader Camper drafting code 6625. Leader Camper, you're recognized on amendment number two. Second. You have a motion and a second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, members, for your patience. I was uh, trying to solve another issue, and I greatly appreciate your, pres your uh, patience with me. And uh, Mr. Sponsor, I, I appreciate you, you uh, rolling, the, rolling the bill down here. Uh, drafting code, Mr. Chairman, 6625. What this amendment would do is the proposed stadium is being built in a historically underserved community and the community has requested to be a part of the process. So what this is trying to do is to make sure that the community um, have a seat at the table as, uh, as things are being developed out, to make sure that uh, from a historical perspective, uh, uh, the things within that community uh, is, is taken into consideration as we are expanding and building out. And I've, I've talked to the sponsor about this, um, and he understands it, appreciates it. I talked to the uh, uh, local uh, county mayor about it to make sure that as development is going on that this community is uh, uh, in the fold, is a part of the conversation, and that history is not destroyed. And the, the uh, Mr. Chairman, the um, sponsor uh, has, has told me that he, he's already made an agreement not to amend this legislation because of uh, some some, some keen negotiations that's going on. So uh, I appreciate you, you you hearing and listening and working with me on this. Uh, but with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna move to withdraw and continue working with the sponsor as they move forward with this legislation. All right, uh, without objection, uh, drafting code 6625 is withdrawn. Without objection, withdrawn. Representative Zachary, you're uh, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to address that quickly, Leader, thank you. Uh, we did have Mayor Jacobs up here yesterday, and uh, you and I did get to spend some time together with him. Um, and I thank you for expressing those concerns, and Mayor Jacob heard those and are taking that back to not only uh, Knox County Commission, but the Knox County City Council, uh, where this project will be developed in East Knoxville. Um, it's vital to that community, to the economic development and future of that community, but also to main, make sure we maintain the heritage of that community. So I really appreciate you bringing this to, to our attention, and I appreciate the amendment. Unfortunately, as you said, I already agreed I would not take any additional amendments. So you have my commitment. That'll be part of the conversation as we move forward. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Members, any discussion on House Bill 1204 as amended? Yes, sir, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman, I know, I know you were all about brief, but if I could, because of the importance of this to Knox County, can I give a brief presentation on this bill before we take any action? I know it's going behind the budget. But when you say presentation, so we can't use any props. No props. <laughs> no, sir. No, no props. But I would just, if I can, I'd like to give just a little bit of detail and context because, again, this is this is a really kind of a once in a generation kind of project for Knox County. Okay. So if I could, can I provide just a little yes. bit of context? Okay, well, members, uh, many of you are familiar with uh, the area in downtown Knoxville as you pass through just off I-40. Uh, when you pass through downtown, it's just to the right, past the AT&T building and past Regas. It's an area that's been blighted for well over 50 years. Um, that is an area that had, literally has no tax base, no jobs, no revenue to speak of any kind. Um, this, we have the opportunity with this piece of legislation that's front in front of you, we have a really a once in a generation opportunity for economic development in East Knoxville. Um, we've had that in West Knoxville with the Westtown Mall, with Turkey Creek. Uh, when people come to Knox County, they come to West Knoxville, they move to West Knoxville, and the mall and Turkey Creek, the development, economic development, that have been huge drivers. Well, uh, well, now with this, it's East Knoxville's turn. I mean, this has the opportunity to completely revitalize a community that, that really needs it and will have a ripple effect uh, throughout the region. So many of you know that uh, Mr. Randy Boyd owns the Knoxville Smoke or the Tennessee Smokies. Uh, he is proposing moving the Smokies back to Knoxville, where they origin originated as the Knoxville KJs. Um, in preparation for that, uh, Mr. Boyd has bought roughly six to eight million dollars in land. That blighted land that's there on the right, as you go east, he has purchased that land. It's roughly 115 acres. He is proposing that that land be provided to the county, to the county and the city through the Sports Authority at no cost. 
Uh, and that will actually be the site for the new stadium that will be built. The stadium will cost roughly $65 million. Uh, it will be owned by the Sports Authority, by Knoxville and Knox County. Uh, the Smokies will be paying roughly a million dollars a year in an annual lease for 70 nights a year. Uh, but we, will, we as a community will use that for two to 300 events a year beyond that. And our hope is to actually draw soccer as a, uh, as a part of this project. Additionally, and this is key, and this is kind of the differentiator for what we're proposing in many other projects. Uh, uh, Mr. Boyd and his, his, um, his, his uh, investors are proposing, per plan on bringing $140 million in private development to the area around the stadium in the land that he's donating to the Sports Authority. And the legislation is really unique in that it guarantees, the legislation guarantees that he will bring a minimum, a minimum of $100 million in private investment. And again, there's nothing there now, nothing. So this will, th if that investment in the private development will create roughly 3,000 jobs, have a e $100 million economic impact with $207 million in spending. It borders an area that is, that is public housing with very limited job opportunities. And again, you're talking about infusing 3,000 3, jobs into an area that desperately needs it. In order, and I'm wrapping up, Mr. Chairman, in order to pay for this project, we're asking that we retain the revenues minus the education portion, not only within the stadium that's already in law now, we're asking that that be extended a quarter mile from around the center of the stadium, basically the land that he's donating, there's no base there now. Uh, legislation is really clear that every tax dollar generated from that area will go to pay for the stadium debt, period. It will not be used for anything else, it will go to the debt. Um, once the stadium is paid off, then that, that money will revert to the state. The legislation is clear. The commissioner of FNA has the final approval of the parcel, and uh, we exclude any tax revenue it may touch today. There's a Weigels and a Barley's. We've excluded that. The entire project has no, virtually no impact to the taxpayers of Knoxville, Knox County, or the state of Tennessee. The revenue generated from this economic development project will pay for the stadium. Uh, the area that currently, additionally, quickly, the area that where the stadium now sits in Sevierville, where the Smokies are, that area is going to be turned into retail, shopping, which will be a real win for the state in terms of economic revenue and a real win uh, for that community. Uh, Knox County is our largest, third, our third largest metro area. We have no professional team of any kind. We're never going to get NFL, NBA, or any of those, obviously. So this is our opportunity in Knox County to bring a sports franchise here with an economic development project that will truly have a ripple effect uh, throughout the region. And just quickly as I close, there have been some conversations about precedent. We've got to be very careful with precedent. My argument would be that this is actually setting a standard for all minor league projects to follow. Never, to my understanding, has this kind of investment been brought by the owner of a sports team. And I would even challenge some of our spoke pro sports teams and some of the, some of the deals you're evaluating now. Uh, Randy Boyd is bringing six to eight million dollars of land and 140 million dollars in private investment. And it's virtually gonna have no impact to the taxpayer. So if anybody, in the community, anybody in the state has this kind of opportunity that we could bring to this, this part of our community, we'd welcome to have that conversation with them, but it doesn't exist. We have, unfortunately, a business leader like Randy Boyd that's willing to invest in our community. The only way for the numbers of this project to work is for us to move forward as the amendment is drafted. We will not be able to make this work dollar-wise if we don't move forward in this way. Uh, and in closing, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is supported by the County Commission, City Council, legislators in the region, our Speaker, our Lieutenant Governor, so we appreciate the support, and, and many of you in the committee, we've talked about that. Um, this is extremely important for our community, and I know it's going to go behind the budget, and I do appreciate you letting me uh, present for this, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you very much. Members, any discussion on House Bill 1204? Uh, Chairman Todd, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and uh, Chairman Zachary, appreciate you bringing this. This is, it's interesting to learn what other uh, things are going on across the state and in communities that will change the plight of a, of a certainly a, a neighborhood or, and a set of neighborhoods and, and, and then the entire city. And, uh, and I appreciate you bringing this and look forward to supporting it. And I would just uh, implore the committee to you know, watch for those other opportunities that are going to be before us over the next few weeks, including some, uh, some significant things in Jackson, Tennessee, in West Tennessee, so uh, for that region. And, and appreciate the support that we've already gotten and, uh, and look forward to, to looking at many opportunities across the state that are going to help the entire state as a whole. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Members, further discussion on House Bill 1204. 
Leader Gant, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. What is the sunset provision in this? Is it 2025? 2025, yes, sir. Okay, thank Correct. you. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, as the sponsor has alluded to, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as the sponsor has alluded to, there is a cost associated with House Bill 1204, uh, so we will have to place it behind the budget and consider it at a later date. Without thank objection, you. House Bill 1204 behind the budget. All right, members, that brings us to item number two. Uh, item, number, item number two in our calendar, sports facilities calendar, is House Bill 157 by Representative Beck. Motion. You do have a motion and a second, sir. Please continue with a brief description. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. First of all, I want to apologize. Civil ju uh, criminal justice ran over, and that's the reason I wasn't here for the first call, and I apologize to the chairman and to the committee. Uh, committee, this is uh, a bill uh, to extend the sales tax recapture policy for Bridgestone Arena uh, through the, the term of the lease it, it just got renewed till 2049 and we're asking that the uh, sales tax recapture be extended to that point uh, this is the home of the predators an amazing outfit they just they I, I love to be here because they just won eight of their last ten games so we're here on a very positive note and a positive note that Bridgestone Arena brings in over 640 million dollars in economic value to this state every year and we don't we don't want a new uh, arena we want to keep Bridgestone and this will allow them to continue maintenance and keep it cutting edge so they continue to serve our state our our, our city and our state uh, by bringing in amazing um, concerts performances monster truck all different types of uh, entertainment and th uh, last year uh, or the year before last uh, 34 percent of the tickets were bought by out-of-state people bringing in their income staying overnight eating dinner r ringing that sales tax and so uh, I have a gentleman from uh, Kyle Clayton the vice president with the Predators if anyone uh, would like having questions that he could could answer and with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Representative Begg. Members, any discussion on House Bill 157? Representative Hall. Thank you. Very quickly, you have a term of affection for the Ryman Auditorium. Do you have a term of affection for Bridgestone Arena? You're recognized. It's the entertainment mecca of the 51st District. <laughs> thank you, Chairman. Well done. Further discussion on House Bill 157. Well, there is a cost associated with House Bill 157. So without objection, House Bill 157 will go behind the budget. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman you. and Committee. All right, members, that brings us to item number three on the sports facilities ca calendar. That's House Bill 975 by Chairman Williams. Sir, you're recognized for a brief description. You have a motion to second. Please continue. Thank you, uh, Chairman and members. Uh, House Bill 975 is the Fairgrounds Motor Speedway legislation. Uh, many of you may know or have seen recently in the news that NASCAR intends to bring racing, uh, professional racing, back to the historic fairgrounds here in Nashville Motor Speedway. This legislation allows for such races and related events to be held at the Fairgrounds Motor Speedway to be treated in the same manner as all the other sports facilities that we just described is, it, as it relates to their tax structures. It authorizes events at the Speedway in Davidson County to be included in the sales tax, the local option tax, and local seat privilege tax structures currently pre uh, presented in Tennessee code. Um, with that, uh, uh, brief description, Chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions members might have. Thank you, Chairman Williams. Member, any discussion on House Bill 975? Seeing none, House Bill 975 does have a cost associated with it, so we will have to place it behind the budget to consider it at a later date. Without objection, seeing none, House Bill 975 will go behind the budget. All right, that brings us to the heel of the sports facilities calendar, and that is Leader Camper. 
Leader Camper, you're recognized on House Bill 1582. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members, I move passage of House Bill 1582. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. second. We have a second. Please continue the brief thank description. You. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Mr. Chairman, members, what this bill would do is put minor league soccer into the same sports authority uh, statute as minor league baseball, minor league hockey, and the uh, Canadian Football League. Right now, minor league soccer is not in that statute, and we'd like to be able to put uh, minor league soccer in the same statute as the other minor league. All right, thank you very much for this description. Members, any discussion on House Bill 1582? Seeing none, it does have a cost associated with, oh, you're recognized. Oh, uh, you didn't talk about the cost. <laughs> no, would you like to talk about the cost? Well, I mean, what are you trying to do with the cost, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I don't think it deserved to be there because if you look at, Mr. Chairman, I am recognized. Oh, absolutely. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, if you look at um, the um, corrected fiscal summary in the uh, decreased measures by the uh, state you will see in the first year, you will see that it also increases local by the same amount. So I feel that that's an offset. And then if you look at the foregone revenue in uh, subsequent years, uh, the local revenue uh, in the subsequent years is more than the um, foregone. So I, I think this is a win, win. We should move this out. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, Lord, oh. If anyone else has any questions on House Bill 1582, seeing none, then without objection, House Bill 1582 will go behind the budget. Thank All you, right. Mr. That, Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, that was a good try. All right, so members, we are back on. Did Representative Zachary, Chairman Zachary, come back in? There we go. That's good timing. All right, members, we're going to move to item number 27. Okay, item number 27 is going to be House Bill 1233 by Chairman Zachary. Sir, you're recognized. You do have a motion to second. Please continue with the brief description. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and then I have the amendment with drafting code. Makes the bill 4834. It is traveling. Awesome. It's traveling. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I didn't hear that. Uh, Members, just quickly, this is the Accommodations for All Children Act, Children's Act that guarantees reasonable accommodations for all children in our public schools while also protecting the well-being of every child. The legislation removes the burden and stress of accommodation from our teachers, administrators, parents, and students. Once this legislation passes, Tennessee will have a very clear path forward for every school across our state. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll take any questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any discussion on House Bill 1233? Seeing none, we are now voting on sending House Bill 1233 on to full finance. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1233 moves to full finance. All right. Item number 54. You have a motion and a second. Give us just a second to get there. Item number 54 in your calendar is House Bill 708 by Chairman Zachary. Sir, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me get to my notes here. Uh, to make up for my long presentation, I'll be brief on this one as well. Uh, this simply allows South College to, pr to, pr <laughs> to participate in the Ben Ashley grant program. Uh, the definition is narrow, only allows South College is the participant. South College is the only private institution that is a primary campus domiciled in the state of Tennessee and that is regionally accredited, not receiving access to the Ben Ashley grant. Uh, it does have a $1.8 million note, Mr. Chairman, but every year through the Student Assistance Award Program, there's an appropriation of $113 million. Currently, only $103 million of, that, of those resources are being used. So that 1.8 would come from that $10 million. So it would take uh, the $113 million appropriation, if we include South College, it will simply bump that up to $105 million. And I believe uh, THEC is here that could quickly speak to that, Mr. Chairman, if you'd like them to. All right, thank you very much. I am going to ask Mr. Lou Hanneman if he'll come up right quick. Without objection, we're going to go out of session. Mr. Hanneman, if you'll come up and just identify yourself for the record. 
Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Lou Hanneman with the Tennessee Higher Education Commission and the Tennessee Student Assistance Corporation. Uh, so just to speak generally to the, the funding mechanism here, the TSAA, the Tennessee Student Assistance Award, is a pool of funds that is appropriated each year in the appropriations bill. Um, historically, since its inception, this program has been first come, first served. For the last four or five years, this program has been capable of funding all eligible students, and we do have a left we do have a remaining balance in the account each year. And so while this is an increase in expenditure from that pool, it does not necessarily require a new appropriation into the fund to cover it. All right, thank you very much. Members, any questions for Mr. Hanneman? Chairman Todd, you're recognized. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Uh, with the money that's left over each year, what happens to that, just for the record? So, good question, sir, thank you. Um, what happens is this money does not revert. Uh, to the general fund. What we're allowed to do under statute currently is because the Tennessee Student Assistance Award is based on a family's expected family contribution, right? So this mirrors in a lot of ways the federal Pell Grant. And so we're allowed to, to expand the number of students who are eligible for awards as we get closer to the end of the fiscal year, if we realize we have funds left over, we can actually fold in a few hundred more students at an expanded award amount. Um, and so, in any given year, that, that money does stay in the program. Does that get to your question? All right, thank you. Chairman Williams. Um, thank you for testing my day. I'm just, I'm a little bit surprised. So there's $10 million you know you didn't use last year. This $10 million, we want to, we want to use that balance, or the remaining balance, to fund South College uh, for additional um, scholarships, and you can do that internally without legislative direction? Not technically, sir. So for this what this legislation is doing is, so there's the Tennessee Student Assistance Award, and then a number of years ago, there was an add-on called the Ben Ashley Award. And what the Ben Ashley Award does is it allows low-income students attending institutions with a higher tuition um, such as the private institutions, um, to receive an additional amount to kind of put towards that higher tuition. South College is currently the only regionally accredited institution not a part of that add-on program. And so, you know, while the statute is needed, the bill is needed in order to allow South College that additional add-on for their students, the funding mechanism for it is available should the legislature choose to add South College. Chairman Williams. So Carson Newman University, Lipscomb, uh, Union University, um, Tusculum University, all these private institutions across the state wouldn't qualify for these additional revenues. They already qualify. All of their students already qualify for this add-on to the Tennessee Student Assistance Award which essentially doubles the award amount um, for a student attending one of these private institutions. And so because of the way the funding structure has been set up over recent years and the, you know, again, we've kind of reached a point where all eligibles are being served, there's no student that's gonna lose their award, you know, in out years, all of that's gonna be covered. We have a sufficient balance left over to cover the increase associated with this bill within the existing pool without any student losing an award. You recognize. So I'm just gonna reiterate what I thought I heard you said to make sure all the private institutions across the state already qualify for this Ben Ashley uh, stipend. That's correct. For additional n numbers. This bill would carve out or allow for this single institution to also participate. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Members, further discussion on House Bill 708. Okay. Seeing none, yeah, members. Without yeah, without objection. Let's go back in session. All right. <laughs> members, we are back on House Bill 708. It does have a cost associated with. We look forward to working through this, and I think we can hopefully get this back to where it needs to, to, to go back before the committee. But until then, Without objection, House Bill 708 is behind the budget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. Thank you.
All right, members, that brings us back to item number one on the regular calendar. Item number one on the regular calendar is House Bill 1286 by Speaker Pro Tem Marsh. Yes. Sir, you're recognized. You have a motion to second. You're recognized for a brief description. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill concerns the Tennessee State Fair. The Tennessee State Fair and Exposition Commission recently recommended to Governor Lee that the St Tennessee State Fair should be moved to the Wilson County Fairgrounds. This legislation specifies the nonprofit Tennessee State Fair Association in conjunction with Wilson County Promotions, Inc., the organization of volunteers who conduct the Wilson County Fair to operate the state fair. And there's already in the, in the governor's proposed budget uh, over $5 million for this project. With that, I'll take any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Speaker Pro Temp. Any discussion on House Bill 1286? Representative Alk, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Speaker Morris. I think this is a great piece of legislation. It brings focus to our, not only our state fair, but also allows us the opportunity to have conversation about our county fairs, our small, large fairs, our regional fairs that we have across the state of Tennessee. I think this is a wise investment that we're looking at. I want to make this committee and others aware that we do have a budget amendment that's, that's being uh, floated around both the Senate and the House. Uh, Senator Bailey is working on it on the Senate side that would call for another $2.5 million to go toward all of our fairs. We've got 56 other fairs across the state of Tennessee, and, and they all support what, what's happening in order to, to, to increase the, the, the visibility and the aspect of the Wilson County Fair to become our state fair. But they, they also want to make sure that we understand and realize that they have some really good fairs across the state of Tennessee. So certainly support this initiative and want to have our colleagues aware that we do have some county fairs, small, large, and regional fairs that are, that are uh, uh, doing good work as well. So thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Speaker Marsh. I just had a quick question. I've heard mixed uh, thoughts about the fair moving from uh, Nashville there. Uh, I, I didn't know if maybe you could clarify that. That Wilson County does want the fair, uh, the state fair, to be moved to to Wilson County. You recognize? As far as I can tell, most everybody there's there's a few that think the state fair will will bring in maybe some undesirables, but they're they're going to have that anywhere you go. But there's a group up there that have gotten together and, and the main group, they want it. They want it badly. And I, I think with this legislation, they can, if they want to, still have the Wilson County Fair and then they can have another fair that's called the State Fair. But I, I think the way it's planned right now, it's all going to be one big fair. We're going to give them, the state's going to put in $5 million to help enhance the buildings and the parking and all that. So most everybody is all on board with this. Chairman Williams. Thank you, Speaker March. I, I just thought because we're going through this process, it's really important to communicate that. I think uh, I have heard from, from my district and surrounding districts their concern about Wilson County being able to maintain its unique and autonomous fair apart from the state fair being moved there. I recognize that the facilities here in Nashville don't lend itself as well to a state fair like they would in Wilson County. So I appreciate you answering the question. I do think it's important that we do what the local community and the state fair want to do. So thank you. And I think it's really important that we do have a Tennessee state fair. That's that's very memorable occasion. And a lot of the agricultural students get to come and, and promote their products and their animals and very super needed uh, thing that I think we should continue. Representative Freeman. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, I want to echo, I've heard some people complaining um, that, that it is moving away from the, the capital of our of our state. Um, I understand the reasons why. Um, it still hurts growing up here. Um, the state fair was always something fun and then always enjoyed going to the Wilson County Fair. And um, I see the increase in revenue and I'm curious if that also includes the decrease in revenue from the Wilson County Fair currently or if this is contemplating both fairs happening or, cause I, I would assume Wilson County Fair is, is big business. And I would assume that there's a lot of revenue there. And is that contemplated in the fiscal summary and the reduction? I, I really, 
you right now. I really don't know that what how they came up with that. I just think I know that we're putting the state is putting in over five million dollars this year, and then I think two hundred fifty a thousand a year for so so many years. So mm. I, don't, okay. I don't know. Well, thank you, Representative Land. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Wilson County Promotions, the <coughs> nonprofit organization that runs the fair. You know, they have a huge fair board. There's many members of their fair board. And um, just to be as inclusive as possible. And sure, some folks, you know, they, they don't like the idea of the Wilson County Fair maybe becoming the state fair. However, the whole body, which is a very big fair board, um, last Thursday night, or maybe the previous Thursday night, voted to that they would like to become the state fair. So the whole um, Wilson County Promotions Fair Board voted, and the result was that they would like to become the state fair. And folks, they really do run a, an excellent fair, and um, I guess they're a, a level three fair, and they really um, do know what they're doing. It's my understanding mm -hmm. this money will go to improve the fairgrounds. Um, Wilson County Promotions runs the Wilson County Fair, and they lease the fairgrounds the Wilson County Fairgrounds from the county every year annually to have that fairgrounds and they'll keep leasing that. So um, there's money that will help um, to improve those fairgrounds so that the great influx of people um, will be comfortable. You know, there'll be facilities to accommodate that many people and any improvements to parking and uh, roadways, uh, side auxiliary roads so that um, people can easily be accommodated and that that's what this will help with so thank you all right thank you representative land further discussion on house bill 1286 seeing none we're now voting on sending house bill 1286 to, on to full finance all those in favor say aye. aye all those opposed no the ayes have it house bill 1286 moves to full finance thank, thank you, you sir. Chairman. brings us to item number two there he is there's Leader Lamberth, item number two in our calendar is House Bill 1205 by Leader Lamberth. Sir, you're recognized. You have a motion to second. Please continue to brief description. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I know that this uh, obviously has a fiscal note and we need to go behind the budget, but for years, and many of you heard me talk about this before, we have not um, completed the mission of funding our 401k match for our state employees. We fund $50, and Chairman, you're carrying a bill to ensure that that 50 is enshrined in statute as it should be. But when we went to a hybrid system and away from a defined benefit system, the, the promise to our state employees is, hey, look, over time, we're going to increase the match that the state does for you. Because if you really run out the actuarial tables on what a $50 per month match, thus $100 invested in a 401k, if you're counting on that for your retirement, retirement you're going to be in real bad shape. I'm trying real hard not to look at Charlie Baum right now because he knows the numbers better than anybody in the world. But it just doesn't, it doesn't work well for our employees. So if we will increase that over time up to a higher number, then they will be better cared for when they retire. And, and all the studies have shown if we can match that with some real good advice from the treasurer's office on how best to invest those funds, it helps even more. So, Mr. Chairman, I know this has a pretty significant fiscal note, but in, in my humble opinion, it's worth it. I, I would like us to keep this at the forefront of consideration. It would add $25, and it would add the additional um, coaching for how to invest those dollars uh, to those employees that want to take advantage of it. Thank you, Leader Lambert. Any discussion on House Bill 1205? Seeing none, as the uh, sponsors already alluded to, House Bill 1205 does have a cost associated with that, and therefore we will, without objection, place it behind the budget. Thank you, sir. Item number three on our calendar is SJR 10 by Leader Lambert, and this is going to go on a special calendar for constitutional amendments on second passage on second general assembly so without objection i'm going to place sjr sjr 10 on the constitutional amendment second passage calendar without objection so moved all right brings us to item number four item number four has been requested to be rolled mr. one week very recognized mr chairman i um consultation with a few other folks, if we could add the amendment on this, it should have been properly filed with the committee. Um, I still would potentially like to go forward rolling this one week, but if, if we could add the amendment, at least if I could make a couple of comments on where we might be headed with this bill, 
um, if that would be okay with you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, absolutely. So we have a motion to second on House Bill 773. There is an amendment as 5840. We have a motion and a second on the amendment. You want to describe the amendment, or would you like to get it put on first? Mr. Chairman, do you have an amendment that's coded 6304? Okay, that was filed, and then it was taken back. So it has not been officially filed. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm comfortable going back. Uh, if we go with 5840, um, the amendment that's coded 6304, and I explained kind of why it's important to get an amendment on this. If you look at the language of the bill, it's just a caption bill. And I want folks to know exactly what we're potentially doing here as we go forward. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't mind if we add on 5840, five, but members just know that at least amendment code 6304 may take the place of that in coming weeks. All right, any discussion on Amendment 5840? Mm -hmm. You want to briefly describe that? Yes, I'll be happy to. So we have, in, in kind of the way we do aviation in this state, we have for decades asked our large carriers, uh, specifically companies like FedEx that have a large footprint here, to fund our smaller airports. Um, there's a better way to do that. I mean, quite frankly, from the general fund, we should be providing a reliable source of funds to our small airports. They should not be linked to the varying ups and downs of the energy market out there. There should be a way so that we can decouple these two issues and you all can have the discussion as to how much money our small airports and large airports need. We can fund that mission for the state independent of whatever tax breaks or increases or decreases that might happen um, with some of our large carrier companies and passenger airline companies because there may be a time that um, some of these companies make decisions that are not in the best interest of Tennessee that some of their taxes may be increased uh, depending upon how they decide to run their companies and how that affects our citizens. There may be a time that some of our good corporate citizens that are investing heavily in our communities that those taxes might go down. And in fact, in this amendment, um, it would take some of that tax burden down. But at no time do we want to harm our small airports or that aviation fund that's out there. So that's what we're trying to do with this amendment and we're still working through that process. And I'm open to suggestion from anyone in this committee um, between now and next week or whenever we go forward with the, with the final version, hopefully, um, but just wanted to let folks know exactly what we are aiming to do here because I think it's very important that we get away from this fee-based budgeting for our small airports. It just doesn't work for them. All right, thank you. Any, Chairman Williams? Thank you. I'd, just a quick question and then um, I guess a parliamentary question. Uh, you stated that the these large entities these large entities were funding small airports. Tell me, t they're, are they writing checks, or, or how, what do you mean by funding airports? You recognize Leader Lambert. Mr. Chairman, thank you for that question, because it goes to the heart of this matter. So our larger airlines that pay in aviation fuel taxes, they go into a fund, and then that fund actually generates a specific amount of revenue for our smaller airports and even some of our larger airports, and that's how this is happening right now. And so it's joined together in a way where really your smaller airports and larger airports, and it affects your smaller ones much more even than your large ones because your large airports have a lot more ability to be able to raise, you know, to raise their own funds. They have a lot more traffic, they have a lot more folks coming through versus your small airports. So they're really chained to how much money comes in on these fuel taxes. So it's not a direct check, but the way we've got it in the budget, it might as well be because it's gonna go up and down depending upon how those taxes are allocated in the code and dependent upon kind of what the energy market's doing out there. And we've gone away from this in many other areas, so we've gone away from this fee-based budgeting. The goal would potentially to do that in this as well. Chairman Williams. Well, I, I, I get what you're saying. So technically they're not, these large corporations are not funding it. A percentage of the tax revenue, which doesn't vary with the cost of fuel, it's simply an aviation fuel tax because they are the largest consumers of aviation fuel in the state, they therefore end up funding through that, through that aviation fuel tax the expenses of both large and small airports. Later, Lamb. Yes and no. Um, it does vary quite a bit, and I have a, a sheet here, if I can find it in a moment, that actually outlines that, that it, uh, it has gone as low as six or eight million and as high as 50 plus million based on, again, from my understanding, both not only just the cost, but the usage of, you know, how many, you know, how, 
to use kind of a car analogy, how often you fill up your tank. If you drive more miles and you fill up your tank more, then our road fund gets additional dollars in it because of the gas tax. It's very similar to this, but it, but it varies pretty significantly per year. Oh, Chairman Williams. Agreed. I, I, think the, I think the interest is as these taxes, whether they're flowage fee taxes or they're aviation f fuel gallonage <laughs> taxes, they were set many, many years ago, and these corporations grew and grew and grew and grew their businesses successfully, and we want to encourage them to stay. I guess it, to, to say that they're funding general aviation at small airports uh, m may be a, a little bit of a stretch, but I, I get your, your point there. I, I agree with you, though, that we need to find something that's both beneficial and a long term so we're not continuing to put non-recurring money uh, to this line item, but the reason why we're putting non-reoccurring money to this line item is because we've helped these large corporations in the past mm -hmm. alleviate some of these the tax burden that they're paying by nature of being a large corporation. So uh, I appreciate your testimony. I get the, the challenge. I think it's a little more complicated uh, than obviously one committee discussion, but I appreciate the opportunity to work with you. I, I, back to the parliamentary question, I don't know if if, if the chair, if the chair, if the leader knows that he has another amendment, uh, I didn't. Do we want to put this amendment on, or we want to roll week and then put the other amendment on, or does his amendment that we don't have rewrite the bill? I guess is the question. You recognized. Thank you, and, and again, thank you for that question as well and comments because it is a very detailed, Mr. Chairman, as you know extremely well. I mean, this is it funds a part of their mission, and it's extremely important to those small airports. But there's lots of funding streams that come in thus how important this question is and i'll be quite frank just from my personal opinion and representing my district um there are corporations out there that stay out of politics they don't um, try to legislate from a corporate boardroom and they're good corporate entities they're good corporate neighbors they trust us to do what we're elected to do and come have these debates instead of trying to use a bully pulpit of their again boardroom policies to try to instill their values on tennesseans um, companies that kind of stay out of politics, I, I have an open ear to helping those companies that are just here to provide a service. Sometimes you have companies that really do the opposite, and we may or may not want to um, go forward in a way that helps some of those companies, depending upon how their corporate behavior is. I just think that's all part of this conversation, um, and that's the debate on some of these issues. So all that being said, if we could put on 5840 for the parliamentary issue, the other amendment is a slight deviation from that, um, so it, but it keeps with the tenor of this, and I did want a caption bill to continue to just roll out there without at least the substantive amendment close to what it would eventually be. Chairman Williams. All right, so committee, here's the posture that we're currently in. We have a motion to second on amendment number 5840. Any further discussion on that? Seeing none, uh, I've got you on the list, but let's do this. This, let's get this since the amendment rewrites the bill, let's get the bill in the proper posture. So let's go ahead and get this amendment on if we can. So without objection, seeing none, we're now voting on putting on House Bill Amendment 5840 onto House Bill 773. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. We are back on the bill as amended. Leader Camper, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sponsor. The question I had uh, dealt with the new amendment that you were talking about, and I'm wondering, did that amendment Leader, address? Let, let's let's do this because we're going to be running about this okay. all day. Let's yeah. just stick with this amendment. You bring us a new amendment, and we'll talk about that one. Is that okay? And mm -hmm. then you can ask all the questions you'd like. But for just the sake of time. If, let's stick on the amendment before us as amended, 5840. You're recognized, Leader Camp. Which is why I wanted to ask my question before we put it on, because we were talking about it in that nature. But I will respect what the, what the chairman has asked me to Thank do. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sponsor. Thank you very much. All right, Chairman Whitson. All right, any further discussion? Seeing none, we have a request to roll this one week. So without objection, House Bill 773. Rolled one week. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and to my fellow members behind me that are waiting on bills, I apologize for taking up so much time. Thank you. All right, that brings us to item number five. There has been a request to roll. So you're recognized. Yeah, um, th I believe there was someone here to 
to testify on that last bill? Um, was is there? There's not time for that. Today? So, I'm sorry. Here's, I'm here's just the request understand. has been made, and without objection, we rolled it. So, if the speaker, I'm going to request that he would come back. We'll hear the bill next week as it's amended, and he may speak on, at that point in time. We've got him on the list already to speak on it when we bring it back before us. So, the speaker may come back. Thank you, sir. All right, that brings us to item number five on our calendars, House Bill 119. We have a request to roll this one week. So without objection, House Bill 119 will be rolled one week. Brings us to item number six. Item number six has been requested to be rolled to the Hill of the Regular Calendar. Without objection, rolled to the Hill of the Regular Calendar. It brings us to item number seven. Item number seven is House Bill 419. That's been requested to roll to the Hill of the Regular Calendar. Without objection, seeing none, that is rolled, House Bill 419, rolled to the Hill of the Regular Calendar. Brings us to item number eight. Item number eight is by Chairman Curcio, House Bill 1347. Sir, you're recognized. Second. You have a motion to second. Please continue with a brief description. House Bill 1347. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. Uh, members, this is my um, bill to address the emergency powers granted to the governor by the General Assembly. Um, We've learned a lot of things over the last year, but one of the things that we were surprised to learn in our fiscal review committee was that uh, the governor can create an executive agency uh, and it, it is outside the normal process of those contracts coming back to GovOps and to fiscal review. Uh, and so this would just seek to remedy that. It, would, it does not prevent the governor from, from doing anything that he or she needs to do in an emergency. Uh, it would just provide some oversight on the back end for the General Assembly. And I'll just say briefly, because I know we're here today to talk about the fiscal impact. There is a, a fiscal note of $4,600. I intend to talk to with fiscal review about that. The legislative intent of the bill is that the it would this would come up at the next already scheduled meeting of the Government Operations Committee. So there should be no additional fiscal impact. The way the fiscal note reads, it would, it would trigger an extraordinary meeting of, of GovOps, and that's certainly not the legislative intent. So even that $4,600 fiscal note may be hopefully going away. All right, any discussion on House Bill 1347? I will say this, Mr. Sponsor, so what is your intention at this point? We go forward, there is still a, there's a fiscal note on it, so right. we will have to go behind the budget. Right. Is that the posture you're ready to go into? Or would you like more time to work on this before we place it? Would, uh, are you, you're, you'll be meeting again, obviously. You've got lots to do, so. Oh, yeah. um, if I could maybe have a week to try and work that out, that would that would be helpful. Okay, Chairman Williams, you're on the list. Would you like to? Okay. All right. So members, you've heard the request from the sponsor. Any objection to rolling House Bill 1347 one week? Seeing none, House Bill 1347 rolled one week. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, that brings us to item number nine, House Bill 784. Also by Chairman Curcio, sir, you're recognized. You have a motion to second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, committee. Um, members, the, the next two bills, this one and the next one, are uh, the governor's criminal justice reform bills. Uh, the first bill deals with alternatives to incarceration. So when we think about um, our, our mental health and substance abuse issue, I think is the best example that we can all sort of uh, visualize in our minds because, unfortunately, it's, it, it has spared no county across the state of Tennessee. Uh, we think about folks with those mental health and substance abuse issues who, yes, have committed a, a minor crime, but thankfully have not turned violent yet. They have not done something for which they, they, must, they must now uh, pay. Um, what this bill would seek to do is to create avenues for alternatives to incarceration, to, to say that we're working with this person to try to keep them out of the county jail or out of the state prison. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chairman Kirstie. Are members, any discussion on House Bill 784? Chairman Williams, recognized. Thank you. I'm, I apologize to the members. I guess I'm the only one uh, going to say anything today, but uh, I want to thank uh, the, the the governor's staff and the, the chairman for this bill. In its original intent, I did not like it at all, to be brutally honest with you. My concern was is that a, an offender might say, well, I'd rather do 15 days in jail than go to rehab. And uh, it's my understanding that the way that the bill is modified, it gives the judge discretion to be able to say, well, I don't think this guy's going to act or, or, or lady's going to go to to rehab and they can give them a, 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 a more strict sentence uh, as it relates to this because we do want people that want to get better to get better uh, and encourage them not to uh, uh, take up residence in our jail population. Right. But uh, I appreciate the governor for working on that because it was something that I heard from my, my district attorney, my local sheriff's office that 
they were concerned about the bill. Just wanted to state that thing. Thank you. Chairman Kersia. Yeah, yeah, everything you said was exactly right. We, we, we wanted to create some discretion in there for the judge to be able to send somebody either to rehab or to say, no, this is not working and, and be able to. So thank you. Chairman Williams. Thank you. Leader Camper, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sponsor, uh, is it the governor's intent to uh, reduce costs of incarceration by offering these uh, alternative measures uh, not incarcerating people and therefore, you know, saving money on the state to pay for, uh, uh, you know, housing inmates. You recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the question. I, 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 as as an advocate of reforming our criminal justice system, I hesitate to use a fiscal argument. And I know we're here in the budget subcommittee to talk about the fiscal impact of this bill. But uh, I would say that that is a byproduct, but we're not doing this to save money. We are doing this to save lives and to prevent future victims. Um, what we know is that if this behavior goes you know, unchecked, what, what I'm fond of, or what I, what I have said many times in committee is that if you take a heroin addict and you lock them up for 10 years, when you release them, they're still a heroin addict. And so you haven't addressed that underlying root cause. As we said a moment ago, some people don't want to be helped and we will always have a hard bed for those people who wanna be bad boys and girls. But for people who truly do want to get their life back on track, that's what this bill is designed to do. So, so yes, there are some cost savings that come along with when you're diverting folks, but that, I wouldn't say that that's the purpose of the bill. I think it's just a, a positive benefit. Leader Camper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was asking the question because I was hoping that with the cost savings, we could do more uh, to help. We could invest more in people. We could you know, have more wraparound services versus the savings just going back into the general fund or something like that. So that's why I asked that question. So uh, it seems that that's part of the intent is to help uh, people that found themselves in this situation. Sure. Thank Chairman you, Mr. Kersia. Chairman. Oh, thank you, Chairman Kersia. Chairman Hall. Thank you, and, and I think that investment is gonna come in the following bill. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think we've, we've made some investments in the bill that that, uh, that will follow this. So I, I think some of our concerns may be uh, relieved in, in, the, in the next bill. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Thank you, Chairman Hogg. Further discussion on House Bill 784. Seeing none, we're now voting on sending House Bill 784 on to full finance. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 784 moves to full finance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. All right, that brings us to item number 10 on our calendar, House Bill 785 by Chairman Curcio. Sir, you're recognized for a brief description. Do you have a motion to second? Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. And yes, this, this will be some more investments on, on this side. So House Bill 785 is called the Reentry Success Act. So again, if you think of these two bills as, um, as, a, as a team, so to speak, one deals with what happens to try to keep folks from going down a path that's gonna lead them to jail or prison. This bill seeks to say, what happens on the back end? Because again, who these folks are when they get out of jail or prison has as much to do with their own desire to get better as it does with the programming and the, and the resources that we allow them to apprise themselves of. So if 95% of the folks who are sitting in our, our jails and prisons are getting out someday, that means a judge did not give them a life sentence, then th that means who are they gonna be when they're next to us in the grocery store or living in our neighborhood and those sorts of things. So uh, several provisions of this bill, I'm also proud to report, came out of the victims roundtable that we hosted over the summer, um, uh, pre-COVID, so to two summers ago now, um, uh, when we, we had our working group around this bill. And I was surprised to hear, along with several members of the administration's team, the victims say, we actually would like to see sort of a transition period, and, and, and that's what exists in this bill. So this was actually incorporates a lot of recommendations that came from folks who unfortunately have become victims. And so one of the provisions in this reentry act is that folks would get out with, with required one year of supervision to help them on a glide path back into society so that they can be productive. Happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much for this description. Members, any discussion on House Bill 785? Seeing none, we're now voting on moving House Bill 785 on to full finance. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. <laughs> House Bill 785 moves to full finance. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, committee. All right, members, item number 11 on your calendar is House Bill 1405 by Chairman Hofford. You have a motion in a second. We'll let... Let's get caught up. Sir, you're recognized on House Bill 1405. You have a motion to second. Please continue with a brief description. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This uh, House Bill 1405 is brought to me by the Farm Bureau and realizing that it has a quite significant uh, fiscal note, the intent of this legislation is to start a conversation related to sales tax within the farming uh, uh, industry. So uh, with that said, uh, we have uh, to give you a couple of examples of what's going on. A few years ago, we passed uh, a bill related to tractors, farm equipment, trailers, uh, spray rigs, et cetera, uh, that removed them from uh, uh, being taxable. Uh, but at the same time, uh, parts for those things are, are still exempt. But at the same time, you have certain items such as oil, grease, um, fluids, and that kind of thing that are taxable. So, so what we're, tr we're trying to do, I can give you another example here. Uh, for instance, in Tennessee, farmers are, are required to fence off their, their livestock. Uh, but at the same time, the fencing materials are, are taxable. So what we're trying to do is get some, some continuity here, some, some um, um, reasonable um, understanding on what should be taxable and what, what would not be taxable. And so, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, that's, that's the intent of uh, House Bill 1405. All right. Thank you, Chairman Hoffman. Members, any discussion on House Bill 1405? Sponsor. Seeing none, there is a cost associated with House Bill 1405, so we will have to place it behind the budget and consider it at a later date. Without objection, House Bill 1405 goes behind the budget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item number 12 is House Bill 214, also by Chairman Hawford. Sir, you're recognized. You have a motion to second. Please continue with the brief description. But before you do, it looks like there is a drafting. We do have an amendment, drafting code 5864. That's correct. Is that correct? That's correct. And it needs Members, to be added. We have a motion to second on the amendment. We have a motion to second. Please continue with the brief description. Um, House Amendment, uh, um, House Bill 214 as amended, uh, creates a nine-member uh, advisory task force of farmers and forester to lead a strategic planning process resulting in the implementation of a plan to position Tennessee as a leading hub to, for ag tech and value uh, added agriculture. The task force will consist of six full-time members and or foresters and three residents involved in ag-related industry. The task force will be attached to the Department of Education, I'm sorry, Department of Agriculture for administrative purposes. It authorizes the task force to create a scope of work to issue a request for proposal for a third party to develop statewide strategy for agricultural innovation entre entrepreneurship led by the farming community. It authorizes the task to call appropriate med agencies for reasonable assistance, requires the, the task force to meet at least three times, and requires the task force to report its findings and recommend recommendations to the General Assembly no later than August 31st, 2022. Thank All right. Chairman. Thank you very much for the description on the amendment. Members, any discussion on the amendment for the sponsors? Seeing none, we're now voting on Amendment 5864 to House Bill 214. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, noes. The ayes have it. We're back on the bill, House Bill 214, as amended. And I think you just described the, the bill and, right. as amended. So, members, any discussion on House Bill 214 as amended? Seeing none, as the sponsor alluded to, it does have a cost associated with it. So, without objection, House Bill 214 goes behind the budget. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You, Chairman and members. That brings us to item number 13. Item number 13 on your calendars, House Bill 330 by Chair Lady Hilton. Chair Lady, you have a motion and a second. You are recognized on House Bill 330. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill seeks to extend the payment payback period from 30 to 35 years for the three border region cities under the Border Region Act. The General Assembly approved to extend the investment period for these regions from 20 to 25 years back in 2018, so this bill simply extends the reimbursement period the exact amount of time. All right, thank you, Chair Lady. Members, any discussion on House Bill 330 by Chair Lady Held? Seeing none, there is a fiscal impact with House Bill 330 that we will have to reconsider it at a later time. So without objection, House Bill 330 will be placed behind the budget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. That brings us to item number 14. Item number 14 on your calendar is House Bill 854, also by Chair Lady Helton. 
You have a motion to second. You recognize for brief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill comes from the Tennessee Association of Assessing Officers, and it does two things. It changes the date from March 1st to March 15th for the Greenbelt applications to be filed with the assessor's office. And this bill deletes a prohibition for a refund when an error has occurred and the taxpayer paid the incorrect amount. This change will mean a taxpayer will not be stuck after paying an amount in error and the assessor can refund it the same as they would under the correction of error provisions. All right, members, any discussion on House Bill 854? Seeing none, there is a fiscal impact with House Bill 854 that we will have to place it behind the budget and reconsider it at a later date. So without objection, House Bill 854 goes behind the budget. Thank you. Thank you. All right, members, item number 15 on your calendar is House Bill 845. House Bill 845 is by Chairman Holesclaw. Sir, you have a motion and a second. You are recognized for a brief description. Thank you, Chairman and Committee members. HB 845 is an omnibus bill, which is premier resort type, and it does have an amendment, which is drafting code 4731. And basically what this does, it just allows multiple entities to sell alcoholic beverages for on-premise consumption. All right. Thank you, Chairman. And the amendment is traveling. So, members, what questions do you have? Discussion for House Bill 845. Seeing none, we are now voting on House Bill 845. Moving on to full finance. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 845 moves to full finance. Thank you, Chairman. If you'd like Can to be move? recorded as a no, please make sure the clerk records you. Thank you, sir. Item number 16 is House Bill 1107 by Chairman Keesley. Uh, we have a request to take this bill off notice. So without objection, House Bill 1107 is off notice. That brings us to item number 17. Item number 17, I think the chair lady is actually chairing a committee. So without objection, we're gonna roll her to the heel of the calendar. Without objection, roll to the heel. That brings us to item number 18 is House Bill 656 by Chairman Moon. Sir, you're recognized. You have a motion second. Please continue with a brief description. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. The Certified Municipal Finance Officers Program began in 2007. Ten years later, the certi uh, cert Certified Financial County Plan began. The municipal plan, the city plan, required 24 hours mandatory continuing education. When the county plan was implemented, it required 16 the county plan had a stipend of $1,000 for participant that successfully completed. The municipal plan didn't. This is a comptroller bill. It's putting the two plans together, reducing continuing education to 16 hours, and then adding a $1,000 stipend to the municipal certified finance officer's plan. The, the municipal plan is mandatory if uh, the city doesn't have a person that's certified, then they have, under this bill, the option of in engaging a CPA that has governmental experience. All right, thank you, Chairman Moon. Members, any discussion on House Bill 656? Seeing none, there is a cost associated with House Bill 656, so we will have to place it behind the budget and consider it at a later date. So without objection, House Bill 656 will go behind the budget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Members, that brings us to item number 19. Number, item number 19 on your calendar is House Bill 1529. We do have a request to take this bill off notice. So without objection, House Bill 1529 is off notice. That brings us to item number 20. Item number 20 on your calendar is House Bill 540 by Chairman Powers. You have a motion and a second. Sir, it looks like there's an amendment that we need to put on, drafting code 6467. Is yes. That's correct. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the amendment. Let's see. Do you want to describe the amendment? Or would you like well, to put it on? The amendment, I, I was going to ask you, too, there was another amendment, too, that was uh, following the with the bill, traveling with the bill, if you needed it. Yes, it's traveling. It's already traveling. Yep, it's traveling. Okay. okay, yeah, so the the amendment that was put on in the Senate, it, it just limits the, uh, goes into the parameters. Um, let me see this one. Oh, yeah, it just limits the, the signs to one college located within a population and the mileage parameters there that are listed on the amendment. Okay, members, you've heard the, the you've heard the description of the amendment 6467. Any discussion on the amendment? 
Seeing none, we're now voting on House Bill. We're now voting on amendments 6467 to House Bill 540. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. We're back on House Bill 540 as amended. Okay. Would you like to be recognized? Uh, yeah, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee. Uh, House Bill 540, this removes the minimum enrollment requirement of 1,000 students to be considered for interstate signage on our community colleges. It puts them on a level playing field with all the TCATs, which have no minimum requirement. And we're proud of our TCATs and our community colleges and what they do and what Tennessee Promise has meant to the state of Tennessee. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll answer any questions and renew my motion. And I do request that this be put in front of the budget rather than behind the budget. Duly noted. <laughs> House Bill 540, any discussion on House Bill 540 by the sponsor? Seeing none, and unfortunately, Mr. Sponsor, <laughs> uh, it does have a cost associated with it, so we will have to place it right. behind the budget oh, gotcha. uh, and consider it at a later date. Without objection, House Bill 540 is behind the budget. All right. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You, Chairman Committee. Appreciate it. That brings us to, there's Chairman Reagan, brings us to item number 21. Item number 21 on your calendar is House Bill 319 by Chairman Reagan. Sir, you are recognized. Second. You have a motion and a second. Please continue with a brief description. Its intent is to move the uh, consumer advocate function, which is currently housed in the Attorney General's office, back to the Public uh, Utilities Commission from which it was taken in the early 90s. Uh, and in so doing, it will save the state government uh, a great deal of money, $868,400, uh, moving it into the Public Service Commission, which is funded by fees by the members is no burden on the taxpayer. Uh, the organization to which it's moved comes before my committee, government operations, if there has to be a fee increase, and they also have some surpluses that they deal with. Uh, with the explanation, I mean, I can go into greater detail on the history of why it was moved and where it was moved and so forth, but essentially, all the states around us have the complaint mechanism in their public service utility commissions and all we're doing is the way we were before the 90s, so this is just moving it back. Uh, there will be a, a separation function so that the complaint mechanism is separated from the uh, enforcement mechanism. With that explanation, I stand ready to answer questions. Thank you, Chairman Reagan. Members, any discussion? Chairman Todd, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Reagan, appreciate you bringing this. this uh, uh, I think this is important to give our consumers the opportunity to file complaints when they have a problem and have it dealt with appropriately. Uh, that's something I've been uh, made aware of in the last few years is just how little our public service commission has to do with public utilities or public utility commission has to do with public utilities. And so I think uh, this may be the beginning of, a, of a, uh, uh, some steps in the right direction to actually bring our public utilities back under some regulatory oversight that we no longer have. And it may come as a surprise to folks, but it, is, it was very surprising to me. So I appreciate you bringing this. And I know that's not, I'm kind of getting off off topic a little bit, but this is a first step, and I think this is good for the consumers. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairman Todd. Further discussion on House Bill 319? Seeing none. Mr. Sponsor, there is a small other fiscal impact that we have to consider uh, in this committee, so without objection. Wait, wait a minute, just miss, miss, Mr. Chair, can I point yeah, out? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the other fiscal impact is to the fiscal, uh, I mean, the uh, agencies, they're fee supported. That physical impact is not to the state. The only other physical impact would be moving it out from under the Attorney General, and I'm sure they're not upset, or let me rephrase that. Perhaps they are upset about having to give up a function from which they were getting Treasury dollars. Uh, our general fund is, is currently going to the Attorney General's office to support this. If we move it, it puts it in a place where it's paid for by the users. So the physical impact that I think you're referring to is on the users, and as was pointed out, the Government Operations Committee is the committee before which they would stand to justify fee increases, as well as not using surpluses that they have available to use. I can say this on the fiscal note. It says it, it does speak about the fact that funding from the general fund will be necessary, and the problem is right now we can't determine to what extent that it will be, I guess, what that number is going to be on the general fund. So that's where 
we're, we're held up a little bit right there. If you want to hold off and, and roll this till we can get this worked out, that's great. We can roll it. Otherwise, we can place it behind the budget and still get it worked out. So it's, it's up to you, uh, really what you would request. The chair's suggestion is acceptable. I roll the bill, sir. All okay. right. Thank you. Without objection, members, before we, well, let's just go ahead and do that. Members, uh, without objection, we're going to roll House Bill 319 one week. Item number 22 in your calendar is House Bill 573 by Chairman Reagan. Sir, you're recognized. You have a motion to second. Please continue the brief description. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman Committee. Uh, as you probably noticed, this is a two-line bill, and essentially what it does is, is uh, require that the current procedure, which makes the state post in the major metropolitan areas when we are having a hearing on uh, creating or terminating public agencies, in the newspapers of those five major metropolitan areas. This changes that so that it's posted on our state website and quite frankly, in my opinion, would be seen by more people in addition to saving us uh, $68,000 a year. All right, thank you very much for this description, Mr. Sponsor. Members, any discussion on House Bill 573? Seeing none, we're now voting on sending House Bill 573 on to full finance. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 573 moves to full finance. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee. All right, members, that brings us to item number 23. Item number 23 in our calendar is House Bill 241 by Chairman Ramsey. Sir, you are recognized. You do have a motion and a second, and you're recognized for a brief description. And, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what this bill essentially does is it extends for two years the executive order number 17 allowing struggling hospitality businesses to uh, uh, sell alcohol with the purchase of food if the alcohol provided has a lid and is not a bottle of liquor and it can be taken from the premises uh, requires licensees selling these uh, alcoholic beverages to go with the food to collect and remit the liquor by the drink tax uh, it has as you notice a substantial fiscal note However, uh, it is local and state uh, in the black, so uh, it's going to make us lots of money. All right. The question has been called on the bill. Any objections calling the question? Hearing none, seeing none, we're now voting on sending House Bill 241 on to full finance. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 241 moves to full finance. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All right, members. That brings us to item number 24. Item number 24 on our calendar there's a request to be rolled to the, one, to the heel of this calendar. Rolled to the heel of this calendar. Yes, sir. Very smart. <laughs> Any objection? Seeing none, House Bill 1039 rolls to the heel of the calendar. That brings us to item number 25, House Bill 226 by Chairman Vaughn. You have a motion to second. You're recognized for a brief description. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm kind of in the same posture that. Uh, Chairman Reagan was in with regards to my physical note on this, but this bill, uh, it uh, creates exemptions to the Medical Laboratory Board for uh, personnel employed by private laboratories and pharmacy laboratories with a approved CLIA, which is a federal license. This was an executive order that uh, the governor passed down uh, during COVID, and we're asking to make it permanent. All right, thank you very much for this description. Members, any discussion on House Bill 226? Seeing none, House Bill 226 does have a cost associated with it, so we will have to place it behind the budget and consider it at a later date. So without objection, House Bill 226 behind the budget. We will go there willingly, sir. Thank you, sir. That brings us to item number 26. Item number 26 is House Bill 443, also by Chairman Vaughn. You have a motion to second. Please continue with a brief description. Thank you, sir. This bill has to do with the creation of a uh, medical school guided graduate medical uh, education program. Uh, CMS uh, is the funding source for the hospital led efforts. What we would like to do is create 100 new medical residencies that is managed by uh, East Tennessee State and UT CHS. And, Memphis, so that's the bill. All right, thank you very much. Members, any discussion on House Bill 443? Seeing none, there is a cost associated with House Bill 443, so without objection, it will be placed behind the budget to be considered at a later date. Any objection? Behind the budget. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Chairman, sir. and thank all of you great Tennesseans for all that you do Tennessee for Tennesseans each week. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to keep going just 
Second. Item number 28 on your calendar. Item number 28 is House Bill 78 by Representative Campbell. You have a motion to second. Sir, you are recognized on House Bill 78 for a brief description. Amendment drafting code 5448, traveling with the bill. Yes, sir. And that rewrites the bill. This is an administration bill from the Department of General Services that makes a variety of housekeeping revisions to the department. Also uh, deletes the uh, Paperwork Reduction Act, which was passed in the 1970s with advances in technology leading to many of the agency forms being distributed online that have made the act redundant. Those, that's among the changes uh, summarized. All right, thank you very much, Representative Campbell. Any discussion on House Bill 78? The question's been called, any objection to calling the question? Hearing none, seeing none, we're now voting on House Bill 78, moving on to full finance. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed no, the ayes have it. House Bill 78 moves thank to full you. finance. <laughs> Members, that is all the time that we have allotted and we are slowly losing members. So unfortunately, we are going to have to roll the remainder items on this regular calendar to next week's calendar. So without objection. Yeah, yeah, all the items on the regular and addendum calendars will be rolled without objection one week. Without objection? Members, let me have your attention just for a second. Let's go to Chair Lady Hazelwood for a quick announcement. Um, for members of this committee and Finance Full next Tuesday in uh, Full Finance, we will be hearing from the administration with the supplemental budget. Thank you. All right, thank you. Members, any further business? Seeing none. Any objection to being adjourned? Seeing none, we now are adjourned.